We come to the close of our studies in the narrative section of Matthew's Gospel, as Jason just mentioned. You may be aware that Matthew's Gospel is made up into five major blocks of material, and each major block has a narrative section with the account of actions and teaching of Jesus, and then a straight instruction section. And the narrative of block four, which we've been in since September, begins in chapter 13, right at the end of chapter 13, and runs right the way through to the end of chapter 17, and then we have the instruction teaching piece in chapter 18. And as we come to these last three incidents that we just heard read to us, we can be forgiven, I think, for asking, as I did, what on earth do these apparently disconnected three incidents have to do with one another and indeed to do with the whole piece that has begun at the end of chapter 13. How are they linked? How do they make Matthew's case? Why did Matthew include them in this place at this point in his presentation? What on earth is going on? Our thesis here on Tuesday lunchtimes is that the gospel writers are highly intelligent. It sounds arrogant to suggest anything other than that. It's highly sophisticated material that the gospel writers were led by God to write what they wrote and they assemble their material to make a point. And we could go through each of the gospels and see that to be the case. So Luke's aim is that we might have certainty. John's aim is that we might believe. Mark's aim is a bold presentation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And Matthew's aim is that we might see the authority of Jesus Christ and go and make disciples of all nations. And of all the gospel writers, I would contend, and I'd be happy to take this up with you afterwards, that Matthew is the most precise. I mean, he was an accountant after all. And you can always feel Matthew, the tax collector, ordering his material with extraordinary precision. And yet, and yet, this incident with the disciples' failure, and then this repetition of the cross, and then this issue to do with a half-shekel tax. I mean, what is going on, particularly with the half-shekel tax? Well, what I want to do is to try and begin to persuade us that these three incidents assembled by Matthew are put together deliberately to draw together the three big themes of the narrative piece before he goes into the teaching section in chapter 18. And indeed, that they are an ideal conclusion to the series that we've been uh, engaged in since September. And if I may, I'm going to break all the rules Okay, so any budding preachers here, do not do this. But I want to show you my working, and this is really how I came to the conclusion. And by showing you the working, therefore I want uh, to be able to persuade you by taking you through the steps. And I started with the easy one. Okay, so let's start with the... So I always say to, to people listening to preachers, if they start somewhere different to where the passage starts, don't trust them. Okay, well, I've tried to explain why we're doing what we're doing, and I thought we'd start with the easy one in verses 22 and 23, the centrality of the cross of Jesus. So page 46, as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he'll be raised on the third day, and they were greatly distressed. Now, were you here last week, you will have heard us just look at three words where God the Father speaks of Jesus as Jesus appears in his uh, post-resurrection glory, and God the Father says of Jesus, listen to him. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased, listen to him. And there was a specificity as to what we were to listen to. And what we were to listen to particularly about Jesus is that he had just told his disciples he was going to his death on the cross. The Son of Man must be delivered up to the chief priests and the elders. He must suffer and die and rise again. And that has been the repeated theme throughout this section. 1621, he must suffer and die. 1624, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. The centrality of the cross of Christ is absolutely there in the section. 17, 1 to 3, Jesus now with this snapshot of his post-resurrection glory and God the Father saying, listen to him. The ultimate Lord and resplendent ruler of this universe ascends to his throne and gathers his people to belong to him for eternity 
in and through his death on the cross. Absolutely central. And here we have Jesus insisting on it again there in verse 22. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Uh, I, my practice when I'm eating my porridge in the morning is to listen to the Today program. I can usually manage about five minutes before BBC Bias gets the better on me and I hit the switch and clock it off. Yesterday I did something which I very, very rarely do and actually listen to Thought for the Day. Normally I switch off if I hear it's coming on because it's so banal. But it was the Nolan Principles yesterday that the Bishop of Liverpool, I think, was talking about, the Nolan Principles of Leadership, of which there are seven. Number one, selflessness. Isn't that remarkable today, selflessness? And what do we see in the Lord Jesus Christ? Selfless, sacrificial death on the cross. And we could spend the whole of the Tuesday afternoon on this. We've done it for the last couple of weeks as we thought about the centrality of the death of Jesus to the whole of the Christian faith. The king becomes king through his death and resurrection. The king gathers his people through his death on the cross. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This is a trustworthy saying. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. God sent forth his son to redeem those under the law so that they might receive adoption as sons. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, putting them to open shame by triumphing over them at the cross. Again, God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. I hope it never ceases to cause each of us to stop in our tracks in wonder and praise and thanksgiving and delight that the Lord and Sovereign of this universe entered into the universe with the express purpose of going to his death on the cross so that we can be forgiven. You shall give him the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Well, there is one of the key themes of this section of Matthew's Gospel. You know, it's introduced explicitly for the first time in Matthew's Gospel in this section that the Christ must go to his death on a cross. But here's the second one in verses 24 to 27. We're breaking the rules. We haven't looked at the first one yet, but well, uh, uh, here's the second one we're going to look at, um, and that is in verse 24 and 27. And here we see the absolute sovereignty of Jesus' rule. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the half shekel tax went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take their toll or tax? From their son or from others? When he said from others, Jesus said, then the sons are free. Now, let me try and explain this. In verse 24, when he talks about the two drachma tax or the half shekel tax, the half shekel tax was an annual tax designed to pay for the upkeep of the temple and worship in the temple. Most adult males paid it and played it gladly in, in Israel. You can read about the provision for temple worship in 1 Chronicles and David set it up insisting that worship of God should go on in the temple. And the two drachma or half shekel tax had nothing at all to do with the highly resented taxes levied by the Romans. Paying the two drachma tax, paying the half shekel tax for worshipping God's temple was a matter of national pride. It was a matter of religious patriotism. So when Jesus says what he says in verse 25... He is not suggesting that he's free from duties to the state, but nonetheless will pay his taxes in order to ensure good order. This passage is not about honoring the state or paying your income tax or rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's. No, it's much, much more significant than that. Whose house is the temple? God's for God's glory. For whom was worship intended in the temple? God, for God's glory. What was the point and purpose of the temple? That God's glory be declared to the whole world, to the nations, 
that the praise of God be declared and God made known verbally. So verse 25, yes, he does pay the tax, but when Peter came into the tax, Jesus spoke to Peter, what do you think, Simon, from whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax, from their sons or from others? From others. Then the sons are free. (laughs) So the argument goes like this. In a monarchy, do the children of the monarch pay their taxes? Well, I know they do in our monarchy because we've got given way to democracy. I'm sorry, no, because we've got a democracy. But if it's a real monarchy, of course the sons don't pay their taxes. You go to the house of Saud with estimated wealth of 1.4 trillion, I can bet your bottom dollar that Prince Abdul, whoever it is, doesn't shed off a whole lot for the income, uh, to the inland revenue. That's not the way the world works in a proper monarchy. So then, given that children of reigning monarchs don't have to pay taxes for the upkeep of their parents' reign, how much more should the Son of God, God the Son, be exempt from tax for the worship in his father's temple? Wow, now it's becoming quite a big claim, isn't it? It is a staggering claim of almost unequal proportions in the gospel. In this section, Jesus has walked on water and declared himself, I am, using God's name. As Peter declared Jesus to be the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus has said to Peter, yes, well done, Peter, you've got it absolutely right, and that's been revealed to you by my Father in heaven. And then he's gone up on the mountain and been transfigured, and in resplendent glory, a voice has come as he's standing alongside Moses and Elijah and announced, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And now, the temple, which is all about the worship of God the creator, with God as its very center, Jesus says, well, I don't have to pay taxes for that. It's my family business. Now, do you see what Matthew is doing now? And as I began to dawn, you know when the sort of the hairs on the back of your neck, you suddenly realize, look at what Matthew has done. He's told us about the cross of Christ, and now he's told us about the sovereign rule and authority of Christ. He is God the Son. The temple's all about him. Of course he doesn't pay tax, because that would be paying taxes to himself. It would completely defeat the object. That's not what you do with taxes. And it struck me, what a wonderful place for us to be as we begin to celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there will be one or two curmudgeons who don't really like the idea of celebrating Christmas. Sorry about the trees and all the rest of it, but you've just got to put put up with it. And we can't put put it off much longer. We're about to celebrate the birth of King Jesus. Don't underestimate the baby. That great temple, that wonder of the ancient world that center of praise and glory and honor to the living God, that glorious place where the truth of God is declared and God is revealed, it's Jesus' business. It's his. That's what he's saying. More than that, what is so interesting is he then says to Peter in verse 27, however, not to give offense to them, by the way, go to the sea and cast a hook. Now, that's quite an interesting thing. It doesn't seem to even have any bait on it at this stage. Take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Now, some of you will know that I'm a very eager fisherman. I've sometimes spent two or three days on a riverbank fishing consistently, morning till night, and not caught a thing, and still will go on. On one or two occasions, though, I know it's not entirely theologically appropriate. I have, while I've stood on the riverbank, said a little prayer that something might come onto the end of my neck. I have never in my entire fishing career cast a hook out without any bait on it and expected to pull up a fish with a check in its mouth to the inland revenue on my behalf. (laughs) Not in a million years, of course not, because I'm not God. But Jesus, having made this extraordinary claim, Peter then goes fishing, and Jesus has provided his temple dues not only for Jesus, but also for Peter. Now, I wonder if I'm going too far at this point, and you must decide for yourself on this one. Is by providing Peter's tax at this, Jesus saying, The temple's all about me. It's my house. It's my business. And I'm providing not only for myself, but you come to me. I provide everything the temple's about for you too. 
The cross, central. The temple, his business. What about the disciples? You see, now I think it's all really beginning to fit together because when you go back... Disciples, the absolute faithless failure of Jesus' disciples in verses 14 to 21. And I really think that's what it's about, their failure. And you have to say that verses 14 to 21 are amongst the most anticlimactic verses in the entirety of the gospel, possibly in English literature. I mean, he has been demonstrated in post-resurrection glory. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. They come down the mountain and after the giddy heights of Peter's confession and following the heady mountaintop ecstasy of the transfiguration, we are brought crashing to the ground with faithless failure. I mean, the pathos of verses 14 to 15 is very, very extreme, isn't it? When they came down to the crowd, a man came up to him, kneeling before him, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's an epileptic and he suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. We used to live alongside an ep- a family with a young epileptic, and you'd often hear the ambulance at two or three o'clock in the morning coming to take them in the middle of a fit. Some of us will remember Laura, who died from epilepsy this time last year. And Jesus' expectation is that with him physically present, and during the time of his earthly rule, physical deliverance from all illness of this sort was a normal part of faithful discipleship. Say that again. With him physically present and during the time of his earthly rule, physical deliverance from all illness was a normal part of faithful discipleship. The point is not that you and I today, were we to have sufficient faith, would be liberated from all sickness. No, when Jesus was physically present in his earthly rule, we benefited from the physical benefits of his kingdom. But now he is physically absent. We have the spiritual benefits, not the physical. We will have the physical benefits when he returns. As an aside, the people who moved into the house where the child with epilepsy lived after they'd moved out had a grown-up child with acute autism. And they had at one stage in their lives, attended a church where the senior pastor had promised them if they had enough faith, their child would be cured. And the father told me about this one day, that they had lived for a number of years persuaded in their minds that their son remained sick because they didn't have enough faith. And they were subjected to what I said to him, in my mind, was appalling abuse, emotional abuse by the pastor who is suggesting absurd things that Jesus never promises. But this incident, once we realize that with Jesus physically present, why we did experience, people did experience the physical benefits of Jesus' rule, uh, this incident highlights the acute failure of the disciples. They fail in faith. And so now we begin to see the cross of Christ absolutely central. We looked at that first, it's the second point. We've seen the sovereign rule of Christ, the temple, that's all his business. But the incidents begin with failed, frail, feeble, flawed disciples. Us. And this has been the consistent theme throughout this section of Matthew's Gospel. This section is about Jesus calling his people to himself. Peter is the model. You are the Christ. He's gathering his people through his death on the cross as resplendent Lord. What kind of people is he gathering? Flawed, failed, feeble, frail. Men and women like you and me. When Jesus feeds the 5,000 earlier in the section, the disciples failed. When Jesus walked on water earlier in the section, the disciples failed. When Peter tried to walk on water, he failed, O you of little faith. When the Canaanite woman came to Jesus, the disciples failed. Get away from him. When Jesus fed the 4,000, the disciples failed again. When Jesus first announced he was going to go to the cross, Peter rebuked him. He failed. And now, once again, the disciples fail. 
And the point is made all the more powerfully here because Jesus quotes from Moses' song in Deuteronomy 32, O faithless and twisted generation. It's a statement made about a whole generation who have failed. And the point is made more poignant, I think, because of Jesus' frustration at the failure of the disciples. Do you see it there? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. It's made me think of Jesus' frustration with my own personal failures in discipleship. What do you must think of William Taylor with my feeble faith? How frustrating he must find it. But above all, this shows us the kind of people that Jesus calls. Feeble, frail, flawed, men and women like you and me. And personally, I found this a tremendous encouragement. And as we come to the carol service, may I say, we've got these carol services. Our goal will be to invite everybody to them. Our eyes will be on those who don't yet know the Lord Jesus. But let's pause as we come to these carol services and we hear the good news. And let's not forget, hey, it has to do with us. Feeble, flawed, frail, failures, spiritual failures like me and you. That's why he went to the cross. And that's why as he fulfills everything the temple is designed for, on our behalf, we benefit. And I found this enormously personally encouraging. So think of my own discipleship. And I hope you find it encouraging too. Who is Jesus summoning? Flawed people. Failed people. Spiritual disasters. And if that's you, well then you have a place in his kingdom. If you'll come to him. Let's pray together. Father, we think of these men who, enabled by your spirit, changed the world as they went out and proclaimed gospel truth. We thank you that you, in your kindness, grace, and mercy, call people who are just simply not up to it, like us. We thank you that uh, the Lord Jesus went to his death on the cross. We thank you that he is your glorious son, your king, the ruler, no less than God. And we thank you that he calls men and women like us. And we thank you in Jesus' name.